Hello, everyone. This is Dory Clark with our weekly Newsweek interview show, Better. And this week's guest is Jim Fielding. He's the author of the new book, All Pride, No Ego, A Queer Executive's Journey to Living and Leading Authentically. Jim, it's terrific to be here with you. Thank you so much for having me, Dory. I really appreciate it. Well, thanks for being here. And so you have had, you know, uh, by, by, you know, some uh, metrics, a very traditional uh, corporate career, you know, mm -hmm. over the years, you rose to some, uh, some pr positions of prominence, you were a top executive at Disney at DreamWorks, you were the CEO of Claire's stores, which any mall goer uh, <laughs> will appreciate. Uh, so so that's fantastic. But talk to me a little bit about the genesis of this book. How long was it in your head that you wanted to write a book? You know, like at the outset of your career, were you like, someday I'm going to write a book about being gay <laughs> around here? Or did it come uh, to you later? How did this happen, Jim? It, it, came, it came later, honestly. I, I was never like on my Oprah wish board or, you know, it, I, I'm a journaler. I'm a storyteller. I'm a journaler. And so I kept records of everything, but it was more for my own journaling to me is a form of meditation really and like a, a form of escape and so it really it really started during the pandemic dory where i was isolated i was living in california at the beginning of the pandemic any of your listeners that lived in california know we were isolated in california we were shut down you were not i was going out to walk the dogs every day on the opposite side of the street from anybody else and that was about it and um i I started to get more active on social media. I started to post more. I started to read more. I, I mean, that was my way of connecting with my friends, with our community. And, you know, things started to happen in the community. And and probably the, the one that spurred it all was the Don't Say Gay kerfuffle with Disney in, uh, in 2022 or 2021, 2022. And I was just not happy at the way Disney handled that and the back and forth. And I got really, really vocal. And what was funny and Dory, this has happened to you because it's more your life than my life. I kind of went viral unintentionally, right? Like people started sharing it. And then I was getting these inquiries like, Oh my gosh, you should write a book. Like I really like the way you write. And, um, and I was like, Oh, I never really thought about that, but maybe I should write a book. Maybe I should write it down because my experience is unique. And yes, I was in the C-suite at many companies as an out gay executive. And what did that look like? And how did that feel? And uh, honestly, you know, a couple of different publishers approached me, thank goodness. And really the, the one that did it for me was John Wiley and Sons, who I'm with, who said, yes, write the book, uh, the incredible editor I'm with, Shannon, and said, I want you to write the book that at the time, 56-year-old Jim wished he would have read when he was 26, to your point, Dory, like, because it didn't exist, right? There wasn't, and I think representation matters and role models matter. There weren't a lot of out gay executives who were willing to tell their story. Um, uh, many of them are still in their jobs, and so they're not necessarily going to tell their story. And even, um, even people who have left haven't necessarily told. And I... I wished I would have read this book when I was 26. It would have saved me, not, not that it, I wouldn't have done some of the things I did, but I think I would have learned and maybe had some guideposts to measure myself off of. And so it really became a cathartic, almost selfish exercise because I was like writing my book to myself. Uh, but I think it's for other, it's a leadership book for everybody, but particularly for anybody who's ever felt like an other. I think that's really what it comes down to is someone who is not a cisgender heterosexual white male, the boardrooms and the C-suites have not really ever been made for us. And so I think that's really who I wrote the book for is um, to challenge that. That's great. We're here with Jim Fielding. His new book is All Pride, No Ego. You can check it out at uh, the eponymous website, allpridenoego.com. <laughs> So, Jim, you you brought this up, and it's a it's a good place to go because I think it's on lots of people's minds. Whether we're talking about Target, whether we're talking about Disney, whether we're talking mm. about Bud Light, whether we're talking about the <laughs> Los Angeles Dodgers, 
there has mm -hmm. been a lot in the press uh, in in recent times about LGBT issues, uh, companies doing some supportive thing. There's a backlash. The company seems paralyzed. It doesn't know what to do. Uh, it either is sort of jerking back and forth or, you know, just sort of uh, staying silent in a somewhat freaked out way. Yes. What should these companies be doing? Like, what, what advice would you give for, uh, for this kind of cultural inflection point where it, it, it seems like in a lot of ways, I'm sure the companies feel like, oh, my gosh, we can't win here. Um, so mm -hmm. what should the move be? Well, I love this question, Dory, and this line of discussion, because to me, it starts with a really an internal soul searching and audit of how committed are you to the cause that you're being an ally for, right? So if, if, if it's LGBTQ rights, Black Lives Matter, whatever, like, are you uh, to do that litmus test are when you get pushback, how truly committed are you? Because someone is going to push back. I mean, the reality is, we are a very polarized, divided country right now. And you are going to be open to feedback and sometimes not so nice feedback the minute you stick your nose into this. And so my question, and I have clients that have called me on this topic and I've said, you guys need to decide internally, why are you doing this? Are you, as I call it, rainbow washing because you think it's something you're supposed to do in June? Or are you really truly committed to this on a year round basis? And what does this look like as part of your complete DEI belonging program? And are you as a C-suite and executives truly committed to it? And do you have your speaking points and your reasons ready to push back? Because here's what's happened in all the examples you brought up. The pushback usually starts on the far right let's face it, homophobic, right? The narrative changes, then the, the company knee jerks, and then the left starts getting mad, meaning us, right? And so they're, totally, they are squeezed in the middle. And I can see people who I respect in the C-suite saying, to your point, we can't win. What are we supposed to do? And that simple answer is stick to your principles. And if you truly believe in it, get out in front and own the narrative. And that just, I'm going to defend Target and poke on Target for a minute because I, I wrote about this uh, recently. Target has been an ally to the LGBTQ community for a very long time. They really got a ton of pushback this year. And what bothered me is that they got super quiet and they let the narrative be driven by the far right and then by the far left. But I was waiting for the CEO or their head of diversity to come out and really tell the story of what was going on because there were so many myths and so many miseducation and facts going on. But I got frustrated because they weren't owning their narrative. And, and then I was like, if you truly are an ally, which I give them credit for, I have worked with Target. I have been at events sponsored by Target that stand up and say you're an ally and why you are and be willing to take, take the the heat because it isn't easy being in a marginalized community is not easy either so if you're going to be our ally feel the heat that we feel every day um and i think if you're a fly by night no offense you're going to drop in for june and think you're going to do a little simple collection and it's going to sell and everything's going to be fine then don't even bother we don't need those kind of allies we need year-round multi-year allies who truly support the cause that's a great point. We're here with Jim Fielding, author of the book, All Pride, No Ego. You can check it out at allpridenoego.com. And <laughs> Jim, you are a former C-suite executive, openly gay. I'm, I'm curious about that experience. Obviously, it is useful in terms of being a kind of role model or a beacon to other mm -hmm. people, both at your company and more broadly, uh, who might be openly gay executives and, you know, wondering, oh, gosh, is there a glass ceiling? Is this something I can do? That's an important message. I'm curious, are there other ways that being out shaped your experience or in, in some ways, was it a little bit of a, a non-issue once you got into the thick of work? What, what was your lived experience in the C-suite? I think, I think in certain companies, it was almost a non-issue, but I also think that's very much based on the company culture and the geography. I think, you know, when I was working and living in California in the media industry, uh, I think it almost was a non-issue. You know, it was just, it was who I was and I was living my authenticity and, you know, I was judged for my performance of my business unit. And that's pretty much how it was. It was different when I moved back to the Midwest to run Claire's, to your point. I think being an out gay CEO, 
I think one of the things about being a CEO is you don't have any peers in the company. You are, you're the top of the company. And so really your peers are CEOs at other companies and you report to the board of directors. And so that reporting relationship is very different than being a president of a division, which is what I was before that, where I had peers, I had queer peers and other divisions that I could network with, that I could go to. And I found myself when I became CEO, hungering for that peer network. And honestly, where I found it in Chicago, I did attend you know, quite a few like Chicago CEO networking sessions. I found my peerdom, my community with female CEOs, not necessarily female gay CEOs, but female CEOs, because again, we were others. We were, we had broken a kind of glass ceiling. And so our experiences were more similar in that um, I would walk into my boardroom and my boardroom was seven straight white men in their fifties. Right. And so we didn't really have a lot of commonality other than the fact that we liked Claire's and we wanted Claire's to be successful. Uh, and I found that intimidating. And I think it triggered, and I talk about this in the book, it triggered insecurities in me that had come since I was a child, right? I, all of a sudden I was right back to that middle school teenager who was struggling with his sexuality and being bullied and being made to feel other. And all of a sudden I'm standing in the boardroom as the CEO and I'm having this internal dialogue with myself you're not being, you're not good enough. You're not smart enough. You're not doing this correctly. Like it was my inner, as RuPaul would say, my inner saboteur would take over. Right. And, and I really felt that. And I write about it openly in the book because I wasn't ready for that. I thought I was ready. I was ready professionally to be a CEO. I definitely deserved that job, but I really did struggle at times. And I went, with my executive coach and my executive therapist, we worked on that because it was triggering things that were 30, 35 years old. And I wasn't ready for it. Like I, and, and I couldn't stand there in front of the board and say, Oh my God, you're bullying me. And you're breaking, you know, you're making me feel less than that. That doesn't work. I had to work on that on my own, but women CEOs had that same feeling, right? Where a male board could be dismissive of a woman, even though she was the CEO that's a form of bullying as well. And so I actually found more peerdom, more community with women CEOs. There weren't a lot about gay CEOs. It wasn't like I was going to be able to call Tim Cook, Dory, right? Like there weren't a ton of like, hey, Tim, I'm over here in Chicago at Claire's. What's it like at Apple, right? Um, I couldn't do that, but uh, there wasn't there wasn't a big network. And, I, and I'm happy because I became a CEO in 2012. I do think the world has changed and there's now organizations of people who are working on this issue, like board membership and C-suite membership. But when I first did it, I was a little bit of a unicorn. Yeah, that's such an interesting point. And thank you for sharing that, Jim. This is Dory Clark. This is our weekly Newsweek interview show, Better. Our guest this week is Jim Fielding, author of All Pride, New, No Ego, the new book. And Jim, so I'm I'm curious. Um, we were just speaking about your kinship with great female executives. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we do every week in our uh, show, Better, is our interview guest nominates someone to be the better mm. leader of the week. And this is someone who's a bit of an unsung hero uh, who is doing great work in one capacity or another to advance diversity issues. Your nominee is mm. Elizabeth Litton Miller of Wild yes. Brain. Can you talk to us a little bit about Elizabeth and why she is your nominee for better yeah, leader uh, of the week? Yeah, Elizabeth is, is a great example. Um, I'm blessed that Elizabeth has worked with me at, I have to count this now, four or five companies now. Um, and we met at Disney in 2001. And she was very early in her career when I first met her in 2001. And cisgender, white, heterosexual female, I should say that up front, but, all, but grew up in California, grew up outside Pasadena, was always a champion and an ally. I could feel it from day one. But not only a champion and ally for human rights in general, she was always a champion and an ally for creativity and innovation and bringing the best out of people, which is very much a message in my leadership philosophy and really encouraging people to own their story, own their authenticity and bring the best of themselves to work, which is a huge message in my book. Um, and I've watched her at Disney, at DreamWorks, at Fox, 
I consulted with her at a company called Then What, and now I'm I'm consulting with her at a company. She's working at Wild Brain, and and that's one of the companies that I consult for. I've watched her grow and blossom over the last twenty plus years, to where now she's a VP. She's in the leadership suite, and. I truly believe part of the reason she's been promoted and rewarded is because she's built amazing teams over time, teams that were diverse, inclusive, had a sense of belonging. And she was able to do that magic of pulling lots of different kinds of people together and make them all row in the same direction and feel uh, empowered and respected. And she's, she's just had some amazing results. And so when I was asked that question, she immediately popped into my mind. Um, as as an ally, but also as a as a person who leads creatively and leads authentically. That's fantastic. Well, three cheers uh, to you, Elizabeth, the yes. better leader of the week. Uh, so thank you for that. Now, Jim, something you talk about in your in your book that I thought was interesting is um, you have uh, an actionable leadership lesson that you share in the book, and what you talk about is. Control the controllable, <laughs> but leave space for the possible, which sounds like an excellent Zen koan. Uh, yeah. Can you unpack it for us and tell us a little bit more about what you mean by this piece of leadership advice? Yeah, it's actually the first part. It's the first learning in the book. And for honestly, eight tenths of my career, 80, 90 percent of my career, it would have just been control the controllable. I was a type A control freak project manager known for delivering on time, on budget, you know, over delivering, uh, over, uh, you know, over delivering, under promising, all of that. And, and was living at a point in my life where a hundred percent of my life was planned personally and professionally. And I thought that's why I was successful. I thought, because I knew 12 months from now, I was on vacation the second week of June. That made me a really, really good leader and a really, really good person. And that's what made me happiest. And what I found, honestly, Dory, is I started to have physical manifestations of the stress of that, where I was not sleeping well and my stomach was starting to hurt. And I was like, wait a minute, like, because I was honestly controlling things that were not controllable. I couldn't control the economy. I couldn't control the weather. I couldn't control whether Russia was going to invade Ukraine, right? Like, I'm not in control of that. And so I really, again, started journaling, started meditating, started working with my executive coach. And realizing that I, I was setting unrealistic expectations for myself that no one is 100% in control of everything. And that I was, my reward system was off. Like I was rewarding myself for something that honestly wasn't possible. And so what I've morphed to now with, with some work is I live in an 80-20 world. I will always be a planner. I will always be scheduled. I will always know when I'm going on vacation because they're important to me. However, I really try on a daily basis, on a weekly basis to keep that 20% of time where I don't have anything scheduled. And at the beginning, I had to actually write block in my calendar or gym time or don't, right? Like I had to write myself a note. And what it meant was sit, listen, you know, listen to music. Maybe that's when you journal. Maybe that's when you meditate. Maybe it's when you work out. Something that was not work oriented because what I found in that space, I call it the space for the possible, the art of the possible, I have found some of my best inspiration, my best creativity, my best big ideas in that space that's not scheduled. I also found that as a leader, by creating that space for your team, I'm better for them. Because if I was maniacally scheduling all of their time, I was not allowing them to be loose. I was not allowing them to brainstorm. I was not allowing them to blue sky. And one of the ways we manifested it at Fox my last quote corporate job was we did no meeting Fridays where we literally said there are no meetings on Friday. You can come in and do whatever you want, but you cannot sit and organize meetings that have an agenda and you're in a conference room. It literally all your meetings had to be Monday through Thursday. People were like, what in the heck is he doing? Like, this is crazy. Even like I would tell other people that we worked with in Fox, Oh, I'm sorry. We're on no meeting Friday. Like we will meet with you Monday through Thursday. And they were like, mm -hmm. Okay, this is weird. I found those days where all of a sudden the happenstance happened. People would walk down the hall and all of a sudden they say, you know, I was just thinking about Simpsons or Bob's Burgers. I think we should try this. And I was like, yes, that is what the space is for. That's the art of the possible. 
That's great. Really powerful. And of course, no, no meeting Fridays or yeah. no meeting whatever days has certainly caught on uh, yes, in yes. years as a, uh, as a powerful tool. So that's, yes. that's really great. I love it. So Jim, Jim Fielding, author of yeah. All Pride, No <laughs> Ego. Uh, we have time for probably just one more question. Sure. But most crucially, I mean, you, you wrote this book in many ways as kind of a a letter to your younger self, you know, a yes. book that you wish that, that you would have had uh, when you were earlier in your career. And so if somebody is watching this who has not yet read your book, they are uh, a LGBT executive, mm -hmm. what would be your advice for them if they want to carve a traditional corporate path for themselves? What, mm -hmm. what do they need to know or to do or to be mindful of that you believe can help them achieve the level of success that, uh, that you did and that they might want to as well? I appreciate this. And, I, and I'm not being cavalier with this answer. I mean, the first thing I, I tell anybody, and I have been able to mentor a lot of people in my life is, are you working in a company where your ethics and morals and needs are aligned with the needs of that company? Because that's my first, it's that audit thing again. Can I be authentically 100% myself at work? And that means the, the best version of myself. Now I am completely under understanding that you need to be safe at work. You need to have economic security. There's a lot of things. And I know there's listeners that cannot. And so I say to them, that's fine. If you cannot change companies, you're not going to change an entire company culture. You're not going to turn around an entire company. If you cannot physically change your company to someone who more closely aligns with your values and needs, then what I say to them is when you are outside of work, be 1000% authentically you and make sure that you are the biggest LGBT, queerest, gayest person you can be outside of work through your volunteer work, through what you do socially, play on the gay softball team, you know, volunteer at your local culture, LGBTQ culture center. Because what I fear for is if people have to, you know, check themselves at work, if they're not fully out at home, I worry for them that there's going to start to be mental and physical ramifications of that because I know that I'm best when I can be me and my taste Jim is not everybody's taste, but I searched my entire career to find places where I was allowed to be Jim. And if I couldn't have done it at work, I certainly was going to do it at home. And um, I, that's my advice to people is like, try the ideal match the company and the job with what you need. If you can't, make sure you can do it at home. It's great advice. This is Dory Clark. This is our weekly Newsweek interview show, Better. You can sign up at doryclark.com, get reminders about our show and other great things. And we have been talking about LGBTQ plus inclusion at work with our guest this week. He's the author of All Pride, No Ego, Jim Fielding. Jim, thank you so much for taking the time to be here with us. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Jim. Thank you all and see you next week.